What we teach people is kind kindness to yourself. Do you think if I taught myself kindness, and I agree with it, God, so many people, so many people take me out of context, it's ridiculous. Take it however the fuck you want to take it. When I was 300 pounds, where do you think that conversation would have got me if I spoke kindness to myself? I'll tell you where it gets me. Right back to 7-Eleven, another box of mini chocolate donuts and a chocolate milkshake. That's the one voice. That's the one voice that most of us have that you're talking about. If you don't have a conversation in there, the other voice that you create that says, oh, okay, how does this look? It looks very ugly. That kind conversation for me went away a long time ago, which is why the dialogue is now, which you see a lot of action, because most people have inaction, because there's one person talking. And that one person is always leading you down the same path the path that makes you feel very comfortable and happy with yourself. The second you create the other voice, there's conflict, there's battles, there's wars, there's defeat. One thing I learned, and I taught myself this, and people go, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm gonna try to break it down real quick. I didn't teach myself victory first. I taught myself failure. I taught myself how to fail. And people are like, that's so depressing, is it? When you're 300 pounds and you can't read and write and you're fucked up, you know how many times you're gonna fucking fail on that process? So if you don't know how to fail, there is no victory. I never talked about winning. Cause I knew the path to winning was gonna be years of failing first. So I taught myself how to fail properly. No one teaches you how to fucking fail. But if you're going out for insurmountable fucking odds that make absolutely no fucking sense, a black kid that can't swim, 300 pounds will be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> okay. You better teach yourself how to fail first. Because if you sit in failure for too long, you will never come out of it. So the first part of my success was learning how to fail properly. And then eventually, I started getting a few victories. But that's what people don't get. When you have buried yourself in such a deep fucking hole, you better first talk about the failures you're going to have first. And that's when that other voice comes up. It tells you we got to do something. But it also tells you, boy, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, Goggins. You're in for a fucking climb, bro. You're going to get your ass handed to you, made fun of, the outside noise, the inside noise. Both voices are going to be telling you to go fuck yourself. You are in for hell, bro. I am. So I've been learning to fail. When I first got into endurance events, I loved the breakdown phase because the suffering made me feel alive and reminded me that I'd gone all out. This time, I didn't relish it in the same way, but I knew that breakdown was a byproduct of an all out effort and that if I explored the crevices of my mind, I would find valuable lessons, which tend to spill out with any unraveling. Most people prefer to avoid breakdowns like this because the suffering can be so overwhelming. It just might mark you forever. I embrace breakdown and welcome the scarring. There is a hell of a lot of information in scar tissue. Scars are proof that the past is real. Physical scars never go away. And when you look at them, they can bring you right back to a specific place in time. But the scar tissue that builds up around that old injury is weak. Professional fighters who've been hit in the face thousands of times bleed faster than those who have never been punched. Once you've been cut deep, you are forever vulnerable to bleeding. The same is true for the mental and emotional scars that we all carry with us. The scars we cannot see. They might be invisible, but they affect us much more severely than physical scars. Mental and emotional scars are our weak spots, and they can open up just as easily as physical scars unless we do the work to strengthen them. If you haven't dealt with your scars, they can alter your life's path. 
You will be prone to failure during difficult physical and emotional situations, whether that's during an athletic event at work or in your home life. And eventually, you will land back in front of your mirror that never lies. Breakdown is its own kind of mirror. Whatever you're made of is laid out in front of you, clear and plain. Your history and mindset become a weather old map ridged with your scars. And if you read them like an archeologist on a dig, you might uncover the code you need to rise again and become better and stronger because there is no transformation without breakdown and there is always another evolution, another skin to shed, a better or deeper version of ourselves waiting to be revealed. Every morning I wake up, it's not just about working out, but for me, working out has been a very big part of my mental growth. So for me, if I am not challenging myself every day, and I swear to God, people will not believe it. I was over almost 300 pounds twice in my life. A person that does that twice in his life does not enjoy cardiovascular activity, <laughs> yeah. okay? Yeah. So people can put anything they want to in their head. I did realize one thing, the things I don't enjoy that I still do, that's where growth is at. Mm. And that's, for me, the only place growth is at is in that very uncomfortable, you know, in that uncomfortable zone. So for instance, today I woke up and I just got to London and I don't know where to run here. It's very difficult to run around this place. Mm. So someone said, hey, you can run around out here, like around this one mile block. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing that. So I went down to the gym and there's this like crazy elliptical trainer, but it's not a normal elliptical trainer. It's one that you like almost self power. So I got on that thing and I realized, man, it sucks. <laughs> and after like two minutes, I'm like, I don't want to do this. So right then I realized, hmm. It looks like we're gonna be here for a while. Mm. <laughs> so I did that for two hours and 45 minutes. So I'm not saying do that, but that's something I did today. Once my mind said, you know what, let's not do this today. And I said, well, since we're, my, my mind went there, I redirected it and said, just for having that weak thought, we're gonna be on here for a while. For many people, the haunting begins the minute they wake up. Maybe they are fat or disabled, feel ugly, or are failing and overwhelmed at school or work, and it consumes them. Their obsession with their own imperfections and faults suffocates self-respect and submarines progress. And from the time they get out of bed until they're able to crawl back in that night, the only thing on their agenda is avoiding exposure and surviving another day in hell. When that's how you feel about yourself, it's impossible to see possibilities or seize opportunities. We have to learn to stop looking for a sign that the hard time will end. When the distance is unknown, it is even more critical that you stay locked in so the unknown factor doesn't steal your focus. The end will come when it comes, and anticipation will only distract you from completing the task in front of you to the best of your ability. Remember, the struggle is the whole journey. That's why you're out there. It's why you signed up for this race or that class, or took the damn job. There is great beauty when you're involved in something that is so hard. Most people want it to be. We can make any obstacle as big or small as we like. When you're climbing a mountain or involved in any other difficult task, the only way to free yourself from the struggle is to finish it. So why bitch about it when it gets hard? Why well, hope it will end soon when you know it will end eventually? When you complain and your mind starts groping for the eject button, you are not bringing your best self to the task, which means you are actually prolonging the pain. The hard chargers keep their heads down and hammer away. They have trained their minds to stay hard in those hard moments. They recognize the false summit for what it is and will always act as if they are nowhere near the top. Most people slow down and suffer on a steep trail, but slope and elevation are of no consequence to the hard charger. They keep their mind in attack mode until there are no more mountains to climb. And when they actually reach the top, they wish it had lasted a little bit longer. If you want to maximize minimal potential and become great in any field,
You must embrace your savage side and become imbalanced, at least for a period of time. You'll need to funnel every minute of every single day into the pursuit of that degree. That starting spot, that job, that edge. Your mind must never leave the cockpit, sleep at the library or the office, hoop long past sundown and fall asleep watching film of your next opponent. There are no days off and there is no downtime when you're obsessed with being great. That is what it takes to be the baddest mother ever at what you do. Know that your dedication will be misunderstood. Some relationships may break down. The savage is not a socialized beast and an imbalanced lifestyle often appears selfish from the outside. But the reason I've been able to help so many people with my life story is precisely because I embraced being that imbalanced while I pursued the impossible dream of becoming the hardest motherfucker ever. That's a mythical title, but it became my compass bearer, my north star. When you observe highly successful individuals, it may seem tempting to conclude that they were inherently born with their capabilities, that they possess innate talent. And that's the end of the story. However, talent, while undoubtedly making life more straightforward, is just one piece of the puzzle. Reflecting back, I was once a shy and fearful person. Ironically, this apparent misfortune turned into a source of strength, igniting significant changes in my life. By consistently stepping out of my comfort zone, I not only conquered social shyness and improved my communication skills, but also nurtured robust self-confidence and overcame other fears in my life. I might not have been naturally inclined to excel in social settings. I still prefer solitude over crowds. However, with self-discipline and persistent effort, I attained remarkable results. So the next time you think you lack talent in a particular area or believe you weren't born with inherent abilities, Remind yourself that in many situations, self-discipline can compensate for the absence of inborn traits. Living life seems easy when you take the hard path and challenging when opting for the easy way out. Self-discipline demands traversing the difficult route, resisting temptations and immediate gratification in exchange for more substantial and superior rewards in the future. It might seem simpler to avoid discomfort and indulge in immediate pleasures. But eventually, this approach only offers fleeting pleasure at the cost of a potentially much improved future. Imagine a person lacking determination who, when faced with a challenge, chooses to withdraw immediately. How likely is such an individual to achieve something significant in life when their primary value lies in seeking comfort? Contrast this with someone who voluntarily embraces difficulties. They actively seek and welcome challenges as opportunities for personal growth. Each self-imposed trial toughens them, making them less susceptible to being overwhelmed by life's adversities. They become more resilient as they face difficulties head on. When life throws unexpected challenges at them, they are prepared to handle them because due to living their lives through perseverance, they've developed readiness for hardships. Our decisions are made in a moment, but their repercussions can extend throughout a lifetime. Humans possess the ability to resist impulses in exchange for a brighter future. Unfortunately, many people live by the principle of, if it feels good, do it, and if it doesn't, don't do it. Yielding to temptations whenever they arise is akin to surrendering your humanity in certain ways. As intelligent beings, we have the capacity and I would venture to say the obligation to base our decisions on rational thinking, not just on instinct alone. Strive to be a better human by embracing your humanity. Exercise your willpower muscle instead of surrendering to the most primal and least beneficial part of your brain for long-term goals. While primal instincts may provide immediate comfort, they rarely serve well in the long run. No, don't take it like go out there and run through a brick wall as many times as you can. No, I'm not saying be me. Don't run towards them five miles at one time. I'm not saying do that. I'm saying start to learn the mind is powerful. It's powerful, man. It's, it's unbelievable. But people need, they need a thing to get them going. 
right? They need a thing. Right. They need a goal. They need they need a, um, a like it's what well, sometimes the first step is the hardest. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard to take that one million step too, but sometimes the first step is the most. Something about the. Like, yeah, they start going over their phone. <laughs> they start calling people. They don't right. get out of the house. Like, right. it's, it's and there's something about procrastination. It's like oh. you know it's painful. Oh, yeah. You know you should be doing things, but you just keep doing it. You keep itching that scab. <laughs> <laughs> I procrastinate like man every day. I would. That, that's what, <laughs> That's what's so funny, man. People looking like I'm some damn superhero that came down from the gods, from the heavens of Earth. No, man. I don't want to do... <laughs> I'm looking at my shoes for 30 minutes sometimes thinking, man... Man, people people look up to you, Goggins. Damn. I want to do... <laughs> I'm like, I want to do this shit, man. But guess what? You do it. I'm going to do it. As long as you do it. And that's what I know about yeah. it, man. That's what I stopped doing. I'm thinking, oh, man... You- Sit here, you look at your shoes for 30, 40 minutes, you go, you gonna think about it all day long, you go do it anyway. And sometimes you don't have the time to look at your shoes for 30 minutes. No. Those are the those are the beautiful days. Yes. Because you know you just have to go. That's right. And so like there's no room for procrastination. And that's when I when I was in the military, I loved my schedule. Because I knew I had to be at work at seven o'clock. So you better get your ass up at four o'clock, man. You gotta get brother. Cause I had to get before I Right. You know? So that was my mentality back then, man. You know, like I, I had to get the miles and get everything in, man, and and get to work, man. I'm uh, competing with the alpha males.